uh, in Cleveland. Dude, let me just uh, show why. I'll, Kelly, I'll just change here because I made some very minor changes that I want to share with you. I, th I know you saw already. I know that. But this is why. So we are winning football games as usual, right? That, that's what usually happens. And tomorrow is going to be sunny as usual as well. So every Sunday, this is, uh, this is what we have here. So uh, welcome again, and I hope we have a great conference today. So now we'll, we'll talk a little bit about sarcoidosis. This will be an overview, and you're going to hear great lectures uh, later on today on more specific topics. Uh, so I wanted to go over six questions uh, and of course, you can ask more questions later, but those are questions that usually uh, show up in our clinic and we discuss with patients, so I wanted to frame the lecture that way. So of course, we'll start with what is sarcoidosis, then what causes sarcoidosis, who is at risk of developing this disease, what are the symptoms of this disease, how to make the diagnosis, and then of course, how to treat this disease, how, how to make you feel better. The first one, what is sarcoidosis? So in 1999, some very smart people got together and came up with this uh, uh, definition. And I, I think this is uh, good for a couple of reasons, but I'll point out two of those reasons for you. So the first one is they made sure that they stated here that sarcoidosis is a multi-system disease. So we as physicians, we can't focus only in your lungs or in your heart or in your brain. Sarcoidosis uh, affects your body as a whole, so we have to take care of you as a whole, and most of the time, in order to do that, we actually have to use a multidisciplinary team. We can't solve every problem by ourselves, so we need everybody's help, and that's what we try to do in our clinic. We try to really have this multidisciplinary approach to take care of you. The second thing is, uh, they made sure that they stated here how important it is to find this granuloma in the biopsy, right? So let's take a better look at this granuloma. So this is the granuloma. This is what we are trying to see under the microscope when we are trying to diagnose this disease. And if you take a look here, the classic features of the granulomas are those giant cells. So we have those giant cells inside the granuloma. We also see histiocytes, so a lot of those cells here in the granuloma are called histiocytes. And around the granuloma, we have another type of cell called lymphocytes. So lymphocytes are also important in sarcoidosis. But more important, I think, than knowing what the granuloma is, is how does this happen? How is this granuloma formed? So let's take a step back and take a look at how is it formed. We think the best theory out there is that everything starts with an exposure to some antigen, right? We don't know specifically what this antigen is, but that's what we think it happens. And then our cells present this antigen to the lymphocytes. So those lymphocytes around the granulomas, they uh, 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 are exposed to this antigen. More specifically, the T lymphocytes, we have B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, in sarcoidosis, we think the T lymphocytes are more important, and the CD4 positive lymphocytes. So a lot of times when you do bronchoscopies, for example, uh, to try to diagnose sarcoidosis, we check this specific cell here, how much CD4 positive lymphocytes we have in your lungs, and that help us make that diagnosis. Then this cell will stimulate the formation of this granuloma through different mechanisms, but we think that maybe the most important one is this uh, uh, cytokine here called TNF. So again, when we are treating sarcoidosis, sometimes we use medications that block this molecule right here because we think that this is very important to form the granuloma. But I told you that everything starts with an exposure to some antigen. What is this antigen? What causes this disease? And unfortunately, we still don't know, but I think we're going to get there. I think with all of this uh, research that FSR is trying to uh, uh, help us do now, I think hopefully in the near future, we'll get closer to find out what is the, uh, what is the, the antigen. Just to show you some few examples. So down here, firefighters. So the, 
responders to 9-11, the firefighters, some of them actually had sarcoidosis. It's a very well-established cause for sarcoidosis now, the exposure to that event. We don't know exactly what uh, in the smoke, for example, caused the sarcoidosis, but we do have studies showing that some of those patients developed sarcoidosis, some of those firefighters. And then the other thing that is interesting is there are a couple of people looking at infection. Maybe there's some type of infection that we have that uh, uh, develops sarcoidosis. And I want to show you just one of them for now. So there's mycobacteria here. There are a lot of studies showing that we can actually find pieces of this mycobacteria in the granulomas of patients with sarcoidosis. So a lot of people started to think, well, if we can find those pieces there, maybe this mycobacteria is causing this disease. And we actually have studies going on now treating patients with sarcoidosis with specific antibiotics for that mycobacteria. This is just one of the uh, 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 many trials that we have. This is the CLEAR-1 trial. This finished already. It was a small phase one trial. Now we are ending the recruitment for CLEAR-2 trial. And again, if we are doing the study, it's because we don't know if this works or not. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But hopefully in a few weeks or months, we'll, we'll, we'll know the results of this trial and have an answer to that question. So it's very important to continue to try to do that research to try to find out what causes a sarcoidosis to begin with. Um, then moving on to the other question, who is at risk? And I wanted to show just one data. A lot of things are important in this question, but today I wanted to share just one. This is a very recent large study that uh, took place here in the uh, U.S., Dan Culver uh, uh, from, from the Cleveland Clinic was part of this study. And it, it caused a significant change in the way a lot of people thought about sarcoidosis. We used to think that sarcoidosis was a disease of like very young people, 20, 30, 40 years old. And we actually saw in this study that in the U.S., most of the new cases of sarcoidosis are happening in patients that are 55 years or older. So this really changed the way we think about this disease and, and the way we talk about this disease as well. Very important thing here, right, symptoms. So when we have this disease, what symptoms do you have? And again, we're going to have specific talks about some of those uh, manifestations, but just to mention some of them. So as you know, the lung is the most common place to have sarcoidosis. 95% of patients will have some type of manifestation in the lung. If that's the case, shortness of breath, cough. So those are things that you can have from pulmonary sarcoidosis. Uh, you're going to hear a lecture today about ocular sarcoidosis. If you have inflammation from sarcoidosis in your eyes, as you know, you can have redness, you can have blurry vision, you can have floaters. Very important to keep that in mind. If you have sarcoidosis in your heart, so it's actually uncommon to have a clinically significant cardiac sarcoidosis. As you can see here, only 2 to 7% of patients with sarcoidosis will have some problems there. But if you have, you can have palpitations, you can have arrhythmias, uh, you can pass out sometimes. So this, those are the things that can represent sarcoidosis of the heart. We'll talk about some of them today uh, in more detail. I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures about pulmonary sarcoidosis and then sarcoidosis of the skin. Starting with pulmonary sarcoidosis, X-ray is very important, right? So whenever uh, uh, your physician is, uh, thinks that you have sarcoidosis, one of the first things that we do is to do a chest X-ray because, like I showed you, 95% of the patients will have something in the lungs and something in the X-ray. We use a staging system to classify the degree of sarcoidosis in, in the X-ray. This was developed in the 1960s. This is only for x-rays, does not apply to CT scan of the chest, but this still gives us important information. So for example, in stage one here, you have the lungs with no sarcoidosis at all, those are normal lungs, but you have lymph glands in both sides of your chest. This is a stage one pulmonary sarcoidosis. In stage two, you still have those lymph glands in both sides of your chest, but you also have some inflammation in the lungs. So we can see that inflammation in the chest X-ray. In stage three, you don't have those lymph glands anymore. We can see those lymph glands in both sides, but we still see some inflammation in the lungs. 
And stage four is scar tissue. It's very hard to see scar tissue from chest X-ray. Most of the time we have to do a, a CT scan of the chest to look at that. But sometimes we can see that in X-ray and we classify that as a stage four. Why is that important? So this still has uh, a prognostic information. This X-ray by itself can tell me who are the patients that most likely will get better, for example, patients with stage one, or patients like Kelly was saying that we actually shouldn't assume that this will get better. We should take this seriously and we should treat uh, uh, with medications. Stage two, stage three, those are uh, manifestations of sarcoidosis that uh, are harder to go away and we have to treat that appropriately. As I told you, CAT, CAT scan is, is important as well. Uh, um, uh, nowadays, that gives us a lot of more information about uh, how the disease is behaving in the lungs. And those are the things that we can see. Those are large lymph glands in the, uh, in the chest. We can see that in sarcoidosis. Uh, in this CAT scan here, we see a lot of tiny, small nodules that represent inflammation from the disease. Sometimes we don't see that on the x-ray, and if we do the CAT scan, we can see all of those small nodules. Uh, here we have a lot of small nodules. In this one here, we have just a little bit. So very few nodules. In the outside of the lung, in the periphery of the lung, there's a membrane here that we call pleura, and that's one of the favorite places for sarcoidosis to be. If we see that in the CAT scan, the chance of that being sarcoidosis is very high, and the chance of that being active sarcoidosis causing your symptoms is very high as well. And sometimes, like I said, we can see scar tissue in the lungs, and, and those are pictures of, of scar tissue. So CT scan is very important. A lot of times, that's one of the very first tests that we do to try to diagnose and understand this disease. Just a few pictures about uh, a cutaneous sarcoidosis. Uh, like I said, sarcoidosis can affect uh, many organs of your body. The skin is one of the most common ones. And uh, erythema nodosum, I'll show you a picture in the next slide, but those are red raised bumps that you can have, usually uh, uh, on the legs. Lupus pernil is a disease that can affect the bridge of the nose, and this is very tough to treat. Whenever we see that, we have to recognize this as sarcoidosis, and most of the time we have to be more aggressive because this is harder to treat with uh, smaller doses of medications. And very interesting, so we don't know why, but sarcoidosis has a predilection also for scar tissue and tattoos. So when we are trying to diagnose sarcoidosis, we always have to ask if the patient has a scar tissue or tattoos and see if there's any signs of inflammation there. At the end of the day, we have to make the right diagnosis, right? It's a very tough disease to diagnose. A lot of other things can look like sarcoidosis. So when we see patients in our clinic, this is the first question that we ask. Is this really sarcoidosis or is this something else? And there are many ways to reach that goal. So one is, if uh, you present with a classic syndrome, this is the name of a classic syndrome, for example, Lofgren syndrome, with lymph glands in both sides of your chest, erythema nodosum, uh, those red raised bumps here in the leg, uh, joint aches, fever. If this is the, the presentation, this is sarcoidosis. There are studies showing that we don't even need to do biopsies to prove that this is sarcoidosis. We can move on to treatment. Sometimes, to try to make the diagnosis, we have to do lab tests. And the most famous one, without a doubt, is the ACE level, right? A lot of our patients, they come and they already have the ACE level. It is helpful, so if the ACE is very high, it can make us think more of sarcoidosis. If the, if the ACE is very, very low, again, it can make us think a little bit less of sarcoidosis, but it's not perfect. There are a lot of other diseases that you can see here that can cause a high ACE level as well. So the biggest message here is even when you have a high ACE level, we have to do other things to try to confirm this diagnosis. Most of the time, like I showed you in the, one of the very first slides, we have to do a biopsy to prove that we have sarcoidosis uh, under the microscope. And one of the ways to do this is uh, this new technology called endobronchial ultrasound. Uh, so we do that uh, through a bronchoscopy. With this bronchoscope right here, we can go through the vocal cords, go to inside the ear pipes, and we can actually see those lymph glands, one of the favorite places for sarcoidosis to be. We can see that with the ultrasound. And with a very small needle, we can biopsy that lymph gland, 
And at the bedside, most of the time, under the microscope, we can look for this granuloma. So this is maybe one of the most common ways to make the diagnosis of sarcoidosis nowadays. Even when we find that granuloma, look how difficult this is, right? All of those diseases can cause granulomas as well. That's why it's very important to be seen uh, uh, by someone who sees a lot of patients with sarcoidosis because one of the most important uh, jobs that we have is we have to rule out those other things and make sure that at the end of the day, this is, this is what you have. Once we make the diagnosis, then how to treat? Uh, the first question is actually, should we treat or not? Um, if we believe that the, the manifestation of the sarcoidosis is significant and severe, then absolutely we need to treat. If the symptoms that the sarcoidosis uh, are causing are significant, we absolutely need to treat. But sometimes, let's say, if the patients have no symptoms at all, just sarcoidosis in the lymph glands, unfortunately, the side effects of the medication sometimes are even worse than the disease itself. So that's the first question that we need to decide, and we decide that together in the clinic. What's true for one patient, it's, it's not true for, for somebody else. So we have to make an individualized decision. Once we make the decision to treat, those are the options. First line, as you know, steroids. This is a, a very fast way to treat sarcoidosis, but it has a lot of side effects. So we always have to keep that in mind. And with that in mind, with those side effects in mind, we have to know that a lot of times we have to go to a second line agent pretty quick, either methotrexate or azathioprine or the flunamide, this is the plaquenil right here, or mycophenolate, which is the Celsept. And those are medications that for the long run, uh, it's probably better to treat sarcoidosis that way. You have less side effects when you compare to prednisone, and I think this is uh, something that we, we need to be aware of. If your symptoms are very severe, or if your symptoms, your disease is not getting better with those medications right here, we have stronger medications. We have the third line agents that block that TNF, that very small molecule that uh, helps the granuloma be formed. We can use those, the infliximab, which is an infusion, the adalimumab, which is a subcutaneous injection. So we can use that to treat sarcoidosis as well. Again, very challenging to make this decision. We have to make that decision uh, talking to you and understanding your preference, your values, your history. Sometimes you tried uh, some of those medications, you had side effects. We don't need to go back to those same drugs again. We can try different ones. This is one slide that I wanted to show you. This is a study from our group. Then Cover again was part of this study. And it shows how significant can be the side effect from prednisone, right? So all of those things, diabetes, hypertension, uh, obesity, hyperlipidemia, osteoporosis, cataract, all of those things can happen more frequently in sarcoidosis. In this study, hypertension, high blood pressure was the big one. So we have to keep that in mind when we make the decision about how to treat. With that, I'll, I'll end here. So if you want to enjoy this sunny day tomorrow, this is just one of the many options that we have here in Cleveland. <laughs> This is downtown Cleveland. You can see uh, the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame here. You can see the Browns Stadium. You can see the uh, Science Museum. So this is one of the good places that you can visit tomorrow if you're staying. And we'll take questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much.